Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to All Cargo Logistics Investor Earnings Call organized by Bakliwala and Karani Securities India Private Limited. At this moment, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press star and 1. Please note that this conference is recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Sayesh Raja. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah, good morning to all. Uh, on behalf of BNK Securities, I would like to welcome you to the Alcorco Logistics uh, QQSI 22 earnings call. Uh, from the management side, we'll be hearing from Mr. Uh, Ravi Jakar, uh, uh, Chief uh, Strategy Officer, and uh, Mr. Uh, Deepal Shah, CFO. Without taking much time, I'll hand over the call to Mr. Ravi for the initial remarks, and post which we'll open up for the uh, floor for q and Over to you, uh, Mr. Ravi. Yeah, thank you, Salesh. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. These words ricochet in my mind as I speak about our performance today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's earnings conference call. This is Ravi Jakar here, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for All Cargo Logistics, and I have with me on this call my colleague and CFO for All Cargo, Deepil Shah. As the COVID wave continues to subside, I hope all are well in your family, and among colleagues. I wish you festive joys and happiness ahead. I also hope that you have had a chance to look at the presentation and the press release uploaded on the stock exchanges and our website. Speaking about performance, last six quarters have presented different challenges to us, starting with the COVID pandemic, right before we concluded Gati acquisition in April 2020, and then port congestions in India, inventory issues across the world, Suez Canal crisis, cyber attack, and more recently, the second wave of COVID in India. And I'm glad that we have taken every challenge with increased rigor, and our teams across the world have upheld the entrepreneurial spirit and commitment of the highest order, in not just navigating through the crisis, but emerging much stronger than before, improving our performance quarter after quarter. All Cargo has embarked upon various transformation initiatives over the last two years, across the businesses, and the results of the same are visible in the performance. Project Voyager with McKinsey for our international supply chain MTO and the CFS business, and Project Avasha with Alvarez and Marcel for our express logistics and contract logistics businesses are near completion. And we are now steadily progressing on our global IT transformation and finance transformation programs to further strengthen our capabilities and improve efficiency in business. These programs will continue to run through 2022. Service businesses are built by people, and leadership is a key pillar for all cargo. The record performance has been delivered by exceptional leadership of the management teams across all businesses. And company has put strong focus on attracting and retaining top talent. I'm happy to share that all cargo and our subsidiaries EQ Worldwide and Gati collectively over the last 12 months or so, have hired nearly 20 CXO level resources and brought nearly 100 critical leaders and managers across the globe to drive growth and digital aspirations. In addition, there have been significant additions to data science teams, strategy and analytics teams to further strengthen the growth capabilities. The digital footprint continues to expand significantly across the globe. E2360 is now a mature digital platform with front-end deployed on cloud. Data analytics, automation, and data integration are used extensively across E2 platforms. Some key projects within digital include data projects, automation, EQ EDI, EQ Click, and other apps to improve customer experience and service delivery. Such digital capabilities are now also the focus at Gati where we have recently implemented the world-class CRM tool in partnership with Salesforce to improve customer service, client management, and analytics. With this, I now hand over the line to my colleague, Mr. Deepal Shah, to update you on all the financial and segmental performance across various businesses. Over to you, Deepal. Thank you, Ravi. Good afternoon, everyone. As Ravi mentioned, the results of the transformation initiative has now started showing results, which is visible on the performance of the company and its subsidiary and its association. 
Oil cargo logistics reported its highest ever business performance for the quarter with consolidated revenues higher by 113 percent year on year um, at uh, 4978 crores versus 2337 crores in the corresponding period uh, last year. EBITDA was higher by 124 crores, 124 uh, percent on a year on year basis uh, at 363 crores as against 150 crores in the corresponding period during the last year. Tax stood at 264 crores, a growth of 355%. The, the profitability in the last quarter was also higher on account of exception income of rupees 43 crores and rupees 24 crores from the share of uh, profit from associates and gains. Exceptional income is largely driven by gains on the scale of Gati limited subsidiary Gati Kausa. All you all would know. All Cargo has three business divisions, namely the MTO, that is the International Supply Chain, the CSS, ICD operations, and the Express Logistics. India supply chain business is part of All Cargo standalone, while international subsidies are under the All Cargo building, which is a 100% subsidy of All Cargo. Now I would like to discuss the performance of each business segment in detail for the quarter starting with the MTO business, that is the International Supply Chain business. Um, the MTO business witnessed sustained growth on back of volume growth and expansion of market share in favorable market, market conditions. Addressing your questions on, on FCL and MCL breakup, which we have now started to report, separate volumes and highlight growth in each of them. We continue to consolidate our leadership in the global MCL market, commanding approximately 40% market share. As you are all aware, this is a very fragmented market. MCL volumes for the quarter grew by 23%. Year on year and FCL volume grew by 29% year on year. MTO segment reported a revenue of 4,384 crores, higher by 138% year on year, against 1841 crores from the previous quarter. EBITDA stood at 307 crores, a growth of 182% compared to 109 crores in the corresponding quarter last year. On Q2 analyzed numbers, OC stands at its highest level of 56% in the MTO segment. Now coming to the CFS segment. Uh, CFS and ICD segment business continues to deliver of good performance and the economic environment is constantly improving with month-on-month -month improvements in business. While analyzing CFS numbers, we need to understand that last year's same quarter, there were ground rentals were very good ground rentals as part of the income with the margins and profitability. Um, CFS volumes excluding uh, CDs should around 79,794 CDs, growth of 35% year on year against 59,031 CDs for the same quarter last year. Um, we expect the deal with CD to be completed uh, in this quarter and uh, we may probably have a consolidated uh, number going forward in the following quarters. CSS ICD vertical reported revenue of 107 crores, uh, growth of 10.5% uh, year on year against 96 crores in the corresponding quarter. EBITDA stood at 33 crores compared to last uh, Q2 FI21 of 38 crores. Coming to Gati, which is the Express Logistics business, whilst uh, we do have a separate call for Gati and questions related to Gati, we would request uh, to be taken up uh, in that call. Um, this is a uh, high level highlight on the numbers. Uh, Gati Core uh, Express Business and the DKPL reported highest ever tonnage of uh, 2,60,000 metric tons, a growth of 30% against the volume in the corresponding period last year. Revenue of rupees 334 crores higher by 40 percent year on year against 238 crores Q2 FI21. Uh, projects and equipment business, that is the PE business, uh, revenue stood at uh, 92 crores uh, as compared to 69 crores in the previous uh, period uh, last year. Uh, growth of 34 percent year on year. The growth was largely related to improved utilization, which increased from 61 percent last year to 75 percent year on year. Uh, given the uh, improved utilization, the EBIT for the segment grew by 42%, uh, YOI at 9, 9 crores. Uh, coming to the uh, logistics park segment, 
um, the part primarily, as you're aware, it's more of rental income. Um, um, it grew nearly 2x um, back by completion of the warehouses um, uh, in many, many of the phases of the warehouses. Um, to the same period last year, and uh, the segment continues to maintain quarterly revenue run rate of 20 crores. Uh, EBITDA for the segment is still robust at 16 crores. Uh, contract logistics, the contract logistics business, which is the, the JV, the ACCI, uh, the subsidiary, which uh, is a JV, um, uh, which holds the contract logistics business, uh, continues to demonstrate resilience with um, revenue and profit showing significant growth in the quarter. Um, and we are working on um, uh, with the partner in terms of uh, how we want to uh, move forward with the 61% uh, shareholding with them. Uh, we worked on a D major scheme where the contract of the six uh, D majors will move into a separate and um, our supply chain private limited. We applied to NCLT for the same. Um, the idea is that these two businesses are separate and you'd like to uh, you know manage them separately into separate buckets of companies. Now I hand over the line back to Ravi to brief you on the other updates of the business. Thank you uh, everyone for listening patiently. Ravi, over to Thank you, people. So before we move on to the questions and answer, I would like to share some key updates on our acquisitions. Uh, with Speedy Multimodes, we are now concluded the diligence and we expect to sign the share purchase agreement in the month of November. I am glad to share that it is going to be a highly valuable set of transaction for the company. In terms of volumes, it stands uh, to add almost 40% or higher volumes to the all cargo's current CFS volumes. As an asset located closest to the India's gateway port JNPT in the uh, JNPT area, and another asset like facility in Mundra, these would be uh, key additions to the group CFS business. And uh, we are able to acquire 85% and 3D multi modes, 402 crores uh, equity consideration. And it is an extremely value operative deal wherein the speedy multimodes we acquired a company would have cash and fixed deposits of almost 53 crores and uh, would add to the EBITDA for the last six months, April 2021 to September 2021. The company has recorded an EBITDA of 21.5 crores and we believe that the performance should improve from these levels under all cargo post acquisition. On the other acquisition, uh, which was more of a joint venture set up in Korea. We earlier used to have two partners, and we uh, decided to partner with one of them and set up our own company, wherein we are almost half, uh, it's almost a 50 50 partnership. That joint venture was set up with minimal capital deployed of less than just a token capital of about a million US dollars, and the business is already clocking almost 300 to 400,000 uh, US dollars in EBITDA on a monthly basis. In the third and perhaps the most significant acquisition that we conducted recently for Nordicon, Nordicon continues to perform exceedingly well uh, under the EQ's ownership, and the business has expanded almost 5x to 6x when compared with 2019 levels. And the way the deal was structured, acquiring 65% shareholding, it had allowed us to do a structure which allowed it to be more value accretive for us, and therefore for a transaction for which we paid nearly 32 million euros for the entire 100% valuation of which we acquired 65%, the company is already doing almost close to a million dollars in EBITDA every month. We are extremely delighted with Nordicon's performance. I would also like to highlight that while some of their business links got integrated with EQ Worldwide Network over a month ago, most of the uh, network integration happened from 1st November after they served the notice period and therefore some of the incremental gains which should happen at the other EQ offices on the other side of the network would only start to uh, appear from uh, November onwards. Uh, in addition to these acquisitions, we have always stressed upon the importance of uh, focus on being asset light and digitally enabled, and through various disclosures made uh, by way of investor presentations to stock exchanges, we have spoken about our focus on asset light businesses, and in that uh, regard, we are evaluating uh, some options for divestment of the working capital intensive project logistics business. And as we have more concrete developments, we will keep everyone updated. But I would like to reiterate that we continue to be aligned with the strategy and we have also appointed advisors to evaluate uh, various options for restructuring business in the most efficient way 
as we disclose in the investor presentation uploaded on the exchanges. So these are some of the critical updates we wanted to share with you and happy to answer any questions that you have for us today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to add uh, uh, that uh, the, the whole uh, restructuring bit is more strategic and um, uh, more on at a very high level evaluation phase and uh, should not be uh, kind of considered as conclusive at this stage. Uh, and just to, it's more directional in nature uh, that we are approaching. Uh, and and uh, from a good governance perspective, we wanted to just uh, give a high level understanding to the uh, our shareholders of uh, the direction that the company is taking uh, in terms of restructuring. Thank you so much. Should we start with the question and answer session, sir? Yes, we can. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star and 1 on your phone and await your turn to ask the question when guided by me. If your question has been answered before your turn and you wish to withdraw your request, you may do so by pressing star and 1 again. We have a first question from Mr. Sunny Gosal from MK Ventures. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. And uh, first of all, congratulations uh, on a very strong set of numbers. Uh, so I have two uh, broad questions. First of all, uh, basically I would like to get your view on the MTO business. So uh, as per uh, a ballpark calculation, the current uh, quarter's EBIT per TU uh, is almost 10 and a half uh, to 11,000 uh, per TU versus a historical average of about 4 to 4 and a half thousand uh, per TU. So uh, I would like to get a view in terms of what part of this uh, jump is sustainable and how do you see the trends uh, playing out over the next uh, few quarters uh, and basically as the logistics, global logistics and uh, container situation stabilizes, uh, what is the medium term uh, sustainable EBIT for TU which this business can uh, uh, basically uh, be looked at over the next say, two to three years? Right. So uh, happy to provide you a perspective on the international supply chain business. So as you would notice, uh, there are two things which are uh, helping the business. One, of course, is the tailwind from the overall environment. But more importantly, on the back of transformation, which involves sales acceleration and acquisitions, you would have noticed that there's a strong growth in volumes. From a global scale, wherein uh, the trade continues to grow in lower single-digit numbers, with many geographies seeing contractions as well in global trade, uh, our international supply chain business has demonstrated almost 23% year-on-year increase in volumes on LCL and 29% increase in FCL year-on-year in volumes. These uh, volume growth uh, numbers drive an expansion of gross margin while the SG&A costs do not go up and that operating leverage comes straight to EBIT and reflects in the higher EBIT uh, per DU margins. Now, coming to the gross margin itself, uh, there is a higher operating freight environment, but it does not mean that as the freight goes up, our gross margin goes up in same proportion or vice versa. In fact, as we run the world's most uh, largest complex LCL network, we are mostly focusing on the value addition of consolidation. And what that means is that naturally when there's a freight movement up or down, it does impact, but not in the same proportions. So therefore, when the freight rate goes up, uh, gross margin does not go up in the same proportion and therefore the gross margin percentage for us comes down and the reverse happens in a chain scenario. To make it more simple, I would say that if you notice that our revenue has increased to almost double while volumes have let's say expanded 25%, naturally that about 70 or 65-70% multiplier impact is coming on account of the average weighted average uh, freight rate moment. Now, when the freight rates have moved from 1.1.1 uh, to 1.6, 1.7, our gross margin would have slightly improved. Now, this 1.7 level of freight rate in our numbers, as you would see, uh, based on market research, based on our own intelligence, based on the inventory situation, we believe that we do not see a significant correction in the short term, 
However, over the next three to four years, it should find a new normal, which should still be higher than the original level of one. Maybe this 1.6, 1.7 multiplier goes to a 1.3 multiplier uh, over the next three to four years, is what the broad sense we have. And as the freight rates go down, because we would continue to protect the gross margin largely, you would see that the revenue uh, per TU might go down slightly, but the gross margin percentage would increase as a result. So I would say that there would be uh, a minimal impact on the gross margin as the operating freight environment changes, which we do not see changing significantly anyways in the near future. So that's what uh, is happening. And on the back of that, the whole transformation late, late sales acceleration should continue to drive volume expansion, which should more than take care of any marginal downward corrections in gross margin. And given that the SGNA costs do not need to go up from these levels significantly, we should continue to see improved operating leverage for the business uh, in the international supply chain and geo segment. We should continue to drive sustained, strong EBIT margins. Sure, sure. And uh, basically, what uh, do you have any thoughts in terms of how uh, uh, is the global uh, logistics scenario and how long do you expect things to come back to more normalized levels? Uh, what is your uh, uh, reading on that part? So as we mentioned, we uh, while there could be uh, some amount of softening, we do not see a significant softening happening in the near future. We believe that from 12 months from here, uh, you could see some downward trend in the freight rates, which can take another two to three years to settle in, but they would settle at a higher level because the levels prior to COVID were not sustainable, and which is what led to significant challenges for various shipping lines and led to the whole consolidation of the industry as companies were uh, incurring significant losses. So we do not see the industry going back to those uh, loss-making situations for the shipping lines. And therefore, the freight rates are likely to stay above the uh, pre-COVID levels, but they should see some softening uh, on a gradual way over the next three years. That is what is our reading based upon uh, market research and uh, advice that we receive and what we see from our side. Sure, sure. Uh, my second question is uh, on the uh, net debt position. So my understanding is the uh, net debt as of September is about 1,300 crores. Uh, so, considering the strong operating cash flow that we have, plus uh, any cash inflows that we uh, generate from, uh, say, divestment of our uh, cargo logistics business at some point in time, and the proceeds uh, from the Blackstone deal, uh, what is the outlook uh, on that over the next 18 to 24 months, and do we intend uh, to become net debt free, or is there any internal goal to become net debt free by any particular in any particular time frame or over the next 18 to 24 months? Yes, yeah, so I would just make a quick comment and then hand over to my colleague Deepal for more elaborate explanation. As you are aware that the freight rates have gone up by that 1.7 multiplier, it also means that the working capital has also gone up, which has utilized some of the cash, and we have also concluded the. Uh, Nordicon acquisition, Korea joint venture, which has all largely been managed through internal accruals without increasing the uh, debt position in the company. So uh, these are some of the key factors. But to give you more perspective on uh, what is our strategy for the debt in the next 12 months or so, I would request my colleague Deepal to take this question. Thank you, Ravi. Um, so uh, while we are very focused in reducing our debt, uh, uh, from where we are today, and uh, that's our endeavor. And uh, once, yes, you're right, once the Blackstone deal is consummated, uh, we will have uh, uh, lower debt from where we are today. Uh, also, please note that uh, we are sitting on an expanded working capital because of higher uh, level of business and uh, because of higher freight rates. So should the freight rate continue to uh, to be buoyant, so we may continue to have a, uh, a higher working capital requirement to fund that. Um, that's the situation that we are in. If the freight rate kind of uh, come down, uh, the working capital uh, will be kind of strained because some of these are just uh, you know temporary facilities which may kind of uh, uh, reduce the debt as soon as we are able to uh, recover the money. Uh, from the customers. 
also pre code that our recoveries and our dso's are very robust so there is no money which uh, from a working capital perspective which is getting stuck with customers which is not coming back so there is no worry on that as well uh, as far as uh, uh, funding of these are concerned um, we are extremely uh, cautious about uh, how we going to fund our working capital so there are temporary spikes which we are funding to temporary means if the spike uh, if the spike continues to be permanent in nature as we go along we will find a permanent way of funding them uh, as, and uh, yes uh, uh, even if the blackstone be and we just wanted to clarify the blackstone be is we are on top of it and we should be able to finish it by the year end um uh, there are regulatory approvals which are beyond our control which are uh, open are almost on the gone uh, once those are available the registration but to confirm to you most of our debt uh, for these long term will be rrd debt uh, on the warehouses so this will be self funded debt which will be 12 to 14 year old uh, your debt so from a funding perspective or from a uh serviceability perspective we do not really get to be any challenge on any of these debt number that we have uh, so i thought i'll just give an overall picture on how the debt uh, gets started to move uh last line that in the long run we will plan to have only on the asset heavy business we plan to have only the lrds wherever um, the asset heavy business is there and for the rest of the business it will be purely working capital revolver facilities which can be uh, kind of um, uh uh managed with with the working uh, um with the level of business that we have so i just wanted to give you an overview of our approach to the full debt uh, uh positioning of the company thank you so sure, sure. that's quite helpful uh that's it from from me thank you thank you sir we have our next question from mr shrimat krishnan please go ahead sir yeah hi uh, good morning uh, ravi and deepal my question is so related to the recent press release that you know that you stated that you are engaging with jeffries for possible take place take sale in equal line you know considering the fact that the cash flow increase is largely driven by transformation efforts what is the you know rationale for you know for the thought of take sale and uh, to generate close to a pro- in the first half we have generated approximately 400 crores of cash flow in case you are looking at large inorganic acquisition What would be the white spaces that could be filled as a result of, you know, or as a result of the acquisition? Yeah. So, let me give you a perspective on EQ. There are two opportunities for uh, growth at EQ worldwide. One, as you know, that while we are the largest in the world, with a market share of about 13 to 14 percent now, there is still a headroom for growth, and this growth can happen by way of uh, acquisitions. and this is a business which provides significant uh, economies of scale because the way density uh, continues to increase as we handle more and more volumes our procurement continues to improve significantly driving overall expansion in margins and therefore uh, it is important that we continue to look at acquisitive growth which we have done historically there could be some potential opportunities that may come our way for transformational acquisition growth that is one second on the digital aspirations as you know globally the freight uh, industry and the supply chain is getting digitized with uh, players like uh, flexport focusing entirely on digital freight forwarding and we believe that with all the initiatives that we have taken up at eq there could be opportunities to accelerate those digital initiatives and move towards being a significantly a key player in the digital ecosystem we also believe that there are opportunities in and joining areas how we have built up a credible fcl business on the back of an ncl business over the last 4 to 5 years we see similar opportunities in an asset like air business and some of these could also be uh, led by acquisition so these are some of the uh, key potential uh, utilization for fundraise for which we are again i would like to reiterate we are evaluating options and uh, preparing ourselves for any such opportunities that may come our way for growth in eq worldwide uh, in the digital ecosystem and through consolidation thank you uh, you know you rightly mentioned that you have built a strong fcl platform right on the lcl uh, do you think it would be difficult to build a product you know without acquisitions uh, it would be time consuming or are there any barriers which would prevent you 
from doing the same. So you mean certain scales. So while NC and SCL were on the same backbone of ocean freight, air is carried on a different network altogether, and therefore organic growth initiatives, while are underway, might see some obstacles and hurdles. And given our aspirations to deliver value, we would like to explore opportunities for acquisition, which come in in a uh, in a way where why these could be value attractive acquisition. So we are open to exploring uh, opportunities and wants to be in a state of readiness for evaluating such opportunities for equal value. My final question uh, on the restructuring, more from a business perspective, uh, yeah, you, you know, you have split the CFS. I understand CFS is asset light, whereas the logistics part is asset heavy. But uh, are there any business synergies between the CFS and even you know, possible in future that could emerge uh, between the CFS and logistics part? So CSS and logistics parks are two absolutely independent businesses. Logistics parks business is where we construct warehouses, which are given out on lease to, uh, you know, companies like on one hand it could be e-commerce players like Decathlon, Amazon, and Flipkart. On the other hand, it could be contract logistics companies such as our own ACCI. So that business is very different from the container freight stations, wherein we are operating and facilitating exempt freight, and we continue to focus on. Uh, going into more asset light operating contract kind of opportunities in CFS. And the focus there is not on capital intensive leasing, but on operational management of uh, warehouses and container yards to facilitate exit trade and uh, create opportunities from there. So we do not see significant synergies. I would also like to further clarify, since you provided the context on restructuring. On restructuring at this point in time, we have appointed advisors to evaluate uh, what should be done in this more of a strategic level. And as we get more clarity, as we evaluate options uh, of what would be uh, you know ideal, we would uh, share details with all shareholders. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Participants are requested to press star and one to ask a question. We have a question from Mr. Kishokar from CCIPL. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, first, please, sir, many congratulations for excellent numbers. Uh, sir, I wanted to understand that in our NPO segment on the consolidated basis, we did around 263 crore PVIT this quarter. So, so you think that going forward, this number on a quarterly run rate basis is sustainable for us? Yeah. So as I mentioned, we would continue to see strong volume growth. Uh, we could see some softening on the freight rates. A combination of the both should lead to uh, a potential healthy revenue going forward. And gross margin percentages uh, remaining steady with an operating leverage on top of the same sg and cost, habit should continue to sustain. That is what uh, would be the expectation from our side. We are not in a position to completely uh, comment upon how the operating trade environment would be. Uh, but like I mentioned, we have significant resilience in the way the business operates, whereby our dependence on the ocean freight rates is uh, not absolute, but it's only relative to a degree. So therefore, there is a strong uh, volume expansion, transformation net growth, controlled SG&A cost, leading to an operating leverage, which should allow us to continue to sustain the momentum. Great. Uh, also, sir, in your investor presentation, in page number four, under digital transformation, it shows that our uh, ETQ uh, 360 booking, now it's almost a third of our total MTO business, so if I'm uh, interpreting it correctly. So, so uh, what impact is this also showing uh, is it this also reflecting in our profitability number apart from the volume growth and the uh, freight environment? Uh, is this also contributing to our uh, uh, basically marginal uh, and, uh, and high profitability? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, uh, directionally, the digitization on customer bookings would also help. But to answer whether it is helping right now, it is not making a significant impact because what happens is that many of these, uh, you know, digital initiatives lead to, let's say, 8%, 10%, 12% efficiencies. And in, uh, in a largely spread out business, 
where you have resources uh, working on multiple things, it may not lead to a headcount reduction. It may only lead to a partial headcount reduction. But as this 30-32% number moves towards 60-70% number and the business continues to grow, at that consolidated scale, we will be able to drive more operational business without having to hire additional headcount. So that is the way it would lead to improvement in profitability over the two to three year horizon. But has it already led into operational profitability and financial impact of that? The answer would be uh, no, there won't be uh, any significant impact at this point in time. Okay, sir. And sir, lastly, I wanted to understand that uh, regarding this uh, divestment of our uh, project engineering solution business, so, so you think that uh, this is the right time for this because the economy might be in an up cycle and if the capex cycle restarts, then maybe we might be exiting this business at the, maybe after uh, going through all the pain of past many years in the down cycle and just at the cusp of the up cycle, uh, so it is just a thought. I mean, uh, you know the business much better, so just want to be a view on the thing. Yeah, so I would like to clarify uh, the statement we have made, categorically states, we are evaluating the divestment of project logistics business and not the entire P&D segment. Uh, the equipment business, which contributes to uh, almost more than three-fourths of the EBITDA for the company, would continue to uh, remain. We are only talking about the project logistics business divestment, which we believe has become marginal business and has its set of challenges and working capital and does not align with the overall asset light uh, strategy that we have. So therefore, uh, the equipment business, which can potentially benefit from the improved environment, as, as we have seen, the equipment utilization in particular has gone up from 61% last year to 75%. That business continues to be with the company. We're only talking about the project logistics part of the P&D segment, which is uh, more of a working capital intensive and requires significant management bandwidth, given the complexities of the business and is working capital intensive and does not uh, align with the long-term goals and which is where we've been looking at uh, divesting the business. Okay, so thank you very much and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from Mr. Ravi Mehta from Deep Financial Consultants. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Congrats on a good set of numbers. Uh, one small clarification I uh, was going through slide number eight. Uh, so when you are talking of this acquisition of uh, speedy multimodes, uh, wanted to understand if it's an asset light uh, business, then the EBITDA, what you are mentioning in the presentation, does it uh, is adjusted for the index or uh, you know that needs to be done and it would be a lower number? No, so uh, this is an asset light in the sense that it does not own the real estate capital and therefore we have been able to acquire the business in a value executive manner. The uh, JNPT uh, CFS is on a long-term lease from the JNPT Port Trust itself and the Mundra is on a long-term lease from another uh, government entity. And in terms of the EBITDA performance, this is the uh, impact which should come. So like I said, the last six months EBITDA has been 21.5 crores and as we conclude the uh, share purchase agreement in this month, the uh, slightly higher than this because we believe there will be some synergies and improvement from this number as we acquire the business formally. So this number should remain steady or grow from here in terms of additional contribution to our performance. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so I was just uh, wanting to clarify that India 16, uh, you know, you uh, adjust the lease payments uh, uh, in depreciation, so we just wanted to understand if there is any adjustment to be done or it is all uh, being factored in this number. Right, right. I understand. I understand. So, what is the sure. business uh, EBITDA impact we are talking about? Yeah. Sure. And so, Ravi, uh, uh, here. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, the depreciation, so the, uh, the impact of 116 will not happen in EBITDA in any other companies. So, only the depreciation will uh, um, will happen, uh, will be higher, uh, you know, and the, the PBT will be impacted, not the EBITDA. So EBITDA will not have a 116 impact in that sense. Okay. And also one uh, small follow-up to the earlier comment that uh, the equipment business may remain in the company and uh, you're planning to divest the project logistics. 
So in that case, uh, that equipment business is also an asset heavy because uh, you will have to have the fleet of cranes in your books. So just uh, so any change of thought or uh, you know, yeah, let me clarify. Yeah, so let me clarify. There's no change in thought. We continue to look at being asset uh, light, and therefore in the long run, that business also does not align with the group philosophy. But we have to wait for the right opportunity. So at this point in time, we have some opportunities to have some discussions on the project logistics business, which are underway. And we wanted to keep our shareholders aware as things progress. And as in when we have the right opportunity, we would consider directing equipment business as well. From the long-term perspective, we are very categorically focused on businesses where we can be the market leader in the market that we operate, whether it is at the global level or at the country level, and which are asset light and which have a significant uh, play of digital. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. We have our next question from Mr. Pankaj Sarai from Shear Water Partners. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, my question is on the gross margin side. You mentioned that uh, there is not a one to one correlation between the freight rate and the gross margin. Freight rates are up by 1.6, 1.7 times. It does not mean the gross margin will be up by the same. But uh, same factor. So I'd like to understand the cost side of the gross margin better. What are the levers on the cost side uh, that can go up and down? So that even if let's say the state is still at the current level, uh, what kind of things move the gross margin up and down depending on the cost factors? Yeah, so basically, you know, just to understand, if we look at from an LCL perspective, uh, let us say the freight rate is about $100 and we have uh, 20 parcels in there, which we are uh, carrying at a rate of $7 each, which is 140 Now, as our uh, cost for uh, the full container increases from 100 to 200 it does not mean that we increase our margins from $4 to $8 because we increase from 7 to 14 uh, usually, the way business operates, it focuses on protecting the gross margin per CBM. That is how globally the budgeting is done. That's how the teams are aligned. So when the freight rate goes down or the freight rate goes up, they continue to focus on the gross margin per CBM, and which is why the gross margin remains uh, stable in a normal operating environment, wherein freight rates may go up by 20% or may go down by 20%. Now, when the freight rates have gone up significantly, like we see in our case, almost a 1.7 to 1.8 multiplier, naturally, some tailwinds play a role, and therefore, it does not remain absolutely same, but gets expanded. But it does not get expanded in anywhere close to the same relative proportion. And which is why if you would see the gross margin percentage, you would see that it has uh, come down. That's only because uh, the additional cost which we have to accrue does not mean that we are able to multiply our revenue also in the same proportion. And that's exactly what plays out in the uh, reverse cycle as well. Okay, so this means, does this mean that you have contracts, obviously you have contracts in place with the carriers, um, and so the benefit of, so what you're saying is that up and down of, let's say, 10, 20% won't matter being the period of the contract. Um, so does this mean that the contracts are reset every few months or every few years? And what are the trials, so what are the escalation factors built in? That is, is there a correlation between if the pay rate goes up beyond 20%, then you would then your new rate will imply a better gross margin. Just trying to understand the the, the context. Yeah, the so context yeah. yeah, so contracts vary from, you know, three-month contracts to six-month and one-year contracts. These are not, like, much longer than that on the carrier procurement side. And uh, the customer side on the LCL, it's largely a spot market. What I'm trying to highlight is that fundamentally the business operates keeping consolidation and service in mind. And therefore, the business operates on a gross margin per CBM as the key metric. That's what people try to drive at the ground level. And that is what leads to a steady performance. Now, with the increased rate, there is naturally an opportunity to expand upon that to some extent. But it is not the same proportion. It is what I'm trying to highlight. It's not that it's a contractual obligation, but it's the nature of business, how it operates, that all the uh, reductions or escalations do not lead to a same proportionate reduction or escalation. So whenever you would find an increase or decrease in freight rates, you would not find uh, the correlation to be same between our cost and sale, and therefore the gross margin percentage changes. So like I said, as the freight rate moved from 100 to 170, the gross margin did not move by 1.7 times. It moved by a lower number. 
and when it moves back from 170 to 130, it would again move back in a similarly lower proportion. And it will not move back to 100, but to 130, and that also over three to four years. That's the broad uh, assumption we have around how fixed rates would move and how our margins would play out. And given that the volume expansion and other things are going to be more significant, we believe that the impact would not be significant, and hence the confidence on sustained performance in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saraf. We have our next question from Mr. Pratik Kumar from Antique Stock Broking. I would request participants to restrict the number of questions to two at a time. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my first question is on, uh, on this uh, uh, MTO segment. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, we mentioned that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that use of technology or digital in the overall theme of thing has significantly increased and tech force uh, is one of the leading players in global digital trade forward. Uh, so, how are their market share, like when we say 13, 14 percent market share for us, how are their market share? And is this some? Is there anything now? I mean, with significant damp up of issue worldwide, uh, stock, I mean, the system. Is this something that they are doing, which we are still trying to ramp up? Yeah. So uh, let me highlight that as far as the uh, I'll try to give a quick picture. Globally, the ocean freight operates as FCL and NCL. 93% approximately by value is the full container load, wherein you know it's a more easier. A supply chain, you're moving a full container, it can be booked by a forwarder or by someone like us or by the shipping line itself. And then there's LCL, which is about 7% in value terms, wherein people do not have enough cargo to fill in the container and they come to a uh, company like ourselves who are running a uh, global LCL consolidation network, which means that we operate regular services, weekly services to 2400, close to 2400 direct port, uh, direct trade lanes. So these customers get to book the cargo on a scheduled service just like how a full container customer can get by way of shipping line schedules. Now, in this business, we are the pioneers in digitization and none of the competitors. Neither does anybody has the scale that we have globally, nor does anybody have the kind of digital intervention that we are uh, working upon. So we have a leadership on digital as well as far as the LCL consolidation is concerned. But if you look at the freight environment at large, there are freight forwarders, there are shipping lines. Shipping lines are looking at digital interventions. Freight forwarders, while the legacy forwarders are also trying to digitize, there's a new uh, set of forwarders emerging, like I took an example of Flexport, who have uh, minimal share at this point in time, but they are uh, growing significantly. As the industry landscape changes, we believe that ultimately the successful model would be hybrid, which means that a digitally enabled company which has fleet on the ground, because you have to move cargo, you cannot just move in uh, megabytes. And some of the companies like Flexport are digital first, and now they are trying to build up an operational footprint across the world. Companies like us at EQ Worldwide, we have a very robust, strong global footprint. And over the last three years or so, we have been investing behind digital to ensure that we are a significant player in a fully digitized freight ecosystem. So it's not exactly in the right competition on the NC consolidation where we are being threatened by a digital player. We are preparing for a future five years from now, wherein supply chains would flatten and the digital ecosystem would be dominated by uh, hybrid players. And that's what we're preparing for. At this point in time, on the consolidation market, we are market leaders, not just on scale, but also on the digital journey. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, one minute on. Uh, secondly, uh, this Nordicon acquisition got, got integrated in the consolidated results. Uh, how much was this the contribution of volumes from that uh, business? So, of the total 243,000 PUs we have for this quarter? Yeah, so I'll just get back to you with this information. Let me just, I don't recall the exact numbers. I'll get back to you on this number during the call here. Yeah. And just one more thing on uh, the TV multi-mode uh, attribution. So, I mean, uh, let's assume our, uh, our average epic bit for, from CSS segment is around 30 crores. Uh, so, how much that TV multi-mode can add uh, to this number on a quarterly basis? So, as I mentioned on the EBITDA level, we expect that uh, there should be an 
uh, over 10 crores on a quarterly basis uh, should be the potential number on the EBITDA. Sure, thank you, Arandal. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. We have our next question from Mr. Chetan Shah from Chief Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, sir, just uh, one uh, small uh, clarification. In the current quarter of MTO business, uh, how much is the Nordic home acquisition uh, is there in the habit and top line, if you can give, just to get a correct picture about uh, comparison, please? Yeah, that was just the previous question. We'll get back on that number exactly, just a while. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shah. We'll take the next question from Mr. Abhishek Mishra from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for taking my question and congrats on a great set of numbers. Uh, my uh, question is more on the MTO side. So just to understand, uh, you have clarified this, that this business uh, performance looks sustainable. But if I just look on the per TU metrics um, in euros, uh, it's almost, uh, uh, you know, you used to do around 4,000, 5,000, you know, uh, through cycle, uh, even probably lower, a bit per TU. In euros now that number is almost eleven thousand. So I'm just curious that uh, uh, you know this kind of uh, cost escalation uh, from the customers and you know how uh, what gives you confidence that uh, this almost seven eight thousand per TU euro increase uh, you can sustain through cycle. Um, some thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, when we are comparing on an EBIT per TU metric, we need to recognize that uh, this is a relatively lower margin business, wherein the SGNA costs are a significant percentage uh, in play. And as we get operating leverage by increasing the business while keeping the SGNA costs in check, that allows us to significantly improve the EBITDA margin. That is something which is a sustained trend which will continue to aid the environment around the freight rates could lead to some softening, which could lead to the tailwind uh, impact, which we have uh, also, which has also enabled us uh, to expand the margins, may play down. But as I mentioned, the volume expansion should uh, continue to take care of that. And which is why, when I say sustained, I'm not saying that the growth rates of you know doubling or would sustain, but I'm saying the absolute numbers from this level should be sustained with some softening in the in the ecosystem tailwinds and continued strengthening of our volumes, and that leads to a significant uh, improvement in EBITDA because those gross margins fall straight down to EBITDA as we keep the SGNA costs in check. So that's where the confidence is coming from. Right, right. Uh, you, you just to understand in terms of your realization increase that you're seeing, I mean, that realization jump is also significant. I mean, it's almost a 40, 50,000 uh, uh, euro or rather rupees per TU jump that we are seeing. So, uh, you know, that uh, normalization of 40, 50,000 rupees uh, uh, per TU, uh, you know, this is a one-year process or it is a two-year process as for you? So there again, like I mentioned, that again is not just led by, it's a combination of the market environment and the transformation initiatives with a focus sales acceleration on more profitable routes, cutting down of you know, uh, loss-making trade lanes. All of those things are at play in expanding the uh, operating margins and the head, uh, the tailwinds that have been there. We believe them to subside over the next three to four years, but again, uh, not to the pre-COVID levels. While the transformational impact would continue to uh, play to our advantage in improving the sales acceleration and driving profitability across trade lanes. Okay. So, if you look look at, for example, if you would notice. The container utilization has also steadily improved, and that's something which is a pure operational excellence, which uh, also has significant uh, advantage in terms of the bottom line performance. This is a business of scale. As we continue to expand scale, the operating leverage at multiple uh, you know levels comes into play. Right, right. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. Uh, so this was the last question. I hand over the call to you for closing comments. Yeah. So thank you all for uh, and your questions, and hope we've been able to answer them uh, adequately. 
I would like to uh, thank you all for participating on today's call. On the pending question on uh, Nordicon, I would like to state that uh, Nordicon has uh, contributed to approximately uh, 3 uh, million US dollars in EBITDA in the current results. That has been the uh, there has been the number for the three months which we have uh, received from uh, Nordicon. And uh, we believe that we would continue to do well with the acquisitions. We continue to look for opportunities to grow both organically through digitization and by way of an organic acquisitions, which uh, we would only look at selective value creative targets. And if you would look at any of the recent or even the past acquisitions, we have always ensured that the acquisitions have been extremely value creative and we will continue to drive that. And thank you very much for joining us on the call today. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference for today. We thank you for your participation and for using our agency conference service. You may please disconnect your lines now. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.